this golf course is actually it's really significant historically in golf architecture in North America, especially west of the Mississippi. It's the first real modern strategic golf course ahead of Pebble Beach, ahead of Cypress Point, ahead of Riviera. Uh, Victoria Golf Club was here before, but the routing was totally different, completely different golf course. So this was the first one in, uh, that really caught people's attention. One PCM, and that was kind of like that. I was like, oh, maybe I can, maybe I can do this. I'm filming you. <laughs> I'm filming you. <laughs> you are a little taller than Brandon. <laughs> okay, we're good. Cool. Boys, how's it going? We're mm, you know, somewhat here. Somewhat. Getting yeah. through. Just float, floating around in the haze a bit. After a long day at Victoria that tested our tired minds, bodies, and golf games, we dragged ourselves out of bed early, a little blurry eyed and took a short drive west to catch the golden hour at Royal Colwood. Oh my oh. God, this is a rock. Who pushed to come earlier? Uh, Michael and Pat are currently out on that half of the course filming drone work. Um, we lost a drone, so we're down to just Michael's drone and, and Sean's. And... Uh, bum, bum, ba, da, <laughs> wow. Is it three Canadian amps? You four, four Canadian amps. Four. Yeah. So, talk to us a little bit about the membership and its desire to host. Well, you know, it actually it goes back to 1922, okay. uh, and that we had that was our first big tournament, the PNGA. That really put Colwood on the map. It was the first time a lot of people from across the border had come up and played it. They knew of Victoria, but they didn't know of here. But that that really opened people's eyes. And since then, we've just had 25, 30 sort of top level events. Nice. Um, this club has, since its inception, had this tradition of people giving back to the game, people active in Pacific Northwest Golf Association, the BCGA, Golf Canada now with me, uh, Canadian Ladies Golf Association, every level. 
and uh, that's both people contributing in tournaments and in the administration of the game. And it's a it's a legacy that I'm really proud of, and I think it makes it sets this place apart. We were lucky to have not only Dale Jackson join us on the course, but also Nolan Thurgood. Nolan joined us with his dad after missing out in USAM qualifying by just two shots. Nolan's in his senior year at Oregon State, and let's just say he wasn't afraid to give us a crash course in the modern power game. Yeah, that's pretty good. Shot. Yeah, so I started, uh, started doing junior camps here. That's how I got into it when I was about 11. Yeah. And then I kind of was, you know, addicted and into it right away. And I became a junior member when I was 12 the next year. That's a putt. Like I played the Junior Club Championship, and then I played like a Dairy Queen event. It's like this little, ju little junior event here, and I remember I was, I probably got my cap down to like a 10 cap. So I'm thinking, I, you know, like maybe break 80, and like all these expectations, shoot 114. Well, just hate myself. So then after that, kind of, you know, rebuild, adjust expectations, and then slowly play bigger and bigger events, and yeah. Well, second green down there uh, because of the road. Uh, they had to change the road in there. We were playing with Dale this morning and he showed us the original green site, yeah. which was maybe 50 yards or 40 yards shy. And you could see all the undulation in the... The greens were built as the ground. They weren't built greens. They were built the way the ground was, you know. And that second hole, uh, when you had a second shot, you could see the flag, but you probably couldn't see the green because the it sloped away from it. It was all lumpy and rumpy, so they built that one. Brandon just sliced his tee shot, OB, and it slammed into one of these houses. Just waiting to see if we can let someone know that we have scuffed up the shingles a bit here. Doesn't look like anyone's home. 
Nice one, Brandon. I didn't start playing bigger events until I was a bit older. So I played uh, BCM when I was 15, and I hadn't really had any previous success. Mm -hmm. And I just won BCM, and that was kind of like the, I was like, oh, maybe I can, maybe I can do this. There's and something here. It happened that my now now college coach was at, event, at that event, watching someone else. But since I you know, won it and stuff, he kind of like started talking to me, and that's what started it. So there's only two par fives. Um, wouldn't call it the strength of the golf course, but five would be the favorite par five. Um, you need to be able to cut your drive and draw your second shot, so I think that's pretty cool. While the guys in the first group worked on their pace of play, Pat and I took the opportunity to chat with Dale about his experience officiating the Open Championship in 2015. You know, an Open at St. Andrews is absolutely magic. Just magic. That's what I want to talk to you about. So I, I remember sitting uh, just behind the RNA building at the Best Western at 13, and I met a guy who convinced me I needed to come back to watch an open at St. Andrews. Yeah. And his selling point was just showing me the 84 Seven video and just the yeah. fire when he makes that putt on yeah. the team. So we all went back uh, in 15, and we were there on the Saturday that was delayed. Walk us through when a tournament has to get delayed for wins. <laughs> What that decision-making uh, process is like? Well, that in that case, that wasn't really my decision, thankfully. And that's the only tournament I've ever been involved with where you call it because of win. But basically, it was at the point... So they, they made a decision to try and start. They knew it was borderline. And then, I forget, I don't think it was Brooks, but there was somebody out there, yeah. and they the ball moved yeah. when they were getting ready to putt. And that was the sign that the wind had increased. It went up about five miles an hour. What was it that day? 35 knots, maybe? Uh, it was a lot. I mean, that was a big wind. Yeah. And uh, it just became unplayable. And there was more wind out at the far end of the golf course than there was at the clubhouse, right, yeah. the first tee. So, um, the powers that be, uh, you know, it was a it was a tough decision to start, but it was an easy decision to stop because it, you just couldn't play. And the wind just built for, you know, we were there, built for another hour or two and just kept rolling the whole day. It was extraordinary, it really yeah. was. Probably the easiest par three, but seven I think is my favorite par three. Downhill, um, sort of through trees a little bit, some great shape on the green, some neat bunkering.
markers that kind of protect the front. Yeah. Two, 298 to the middle from here. Okay. All right, Mike, what's the play here? Tricky shot. Walk us through it. Um, I did the spinniest shot possible just below this branch, so. Probably uh, slightly back of the stance pitching wedge. Try to keep it under. I'm okay if I hit that first little branch, but not anything higher than that. Right on line, just carry that rough hill. Love it. Solid golf course. For sure. I love the back nine early pick up. It is pretty strong. Yeah. Be, I don't know. Once we got to 11, that long part of three. Yeah, well, the 11th green used to be like a, like a target in front of you, like that. Big green, big bunker in front of it. But in the winter, you couldn't keep a ball on it. I remember being here for the Canadian Am eight years ago, and 11 is so visually deceiving with those trees in the background. Yeah, yeah. It's really cool. 11's one of the holes that doesn't have its original green. It was rebuilt in the 80s. Okay. So um, two, 11, and 16 are not original greens. Um, and you know, it's not, that's not my favorite green, but the hole is a spectacular setting. Absolutely spectacular. No, it really is. For the last year, number 11 and 12 here, um, with regards to the Polish the Gem initiative that I'm sure you chatted with Dale a little bit about, right? Um, one of our goals is to bring the course back to sort of the AV McCann design and always sure. keep that in mind. And so what we did here was um, we removed a number of trees on the right hand side here to open up the view and bring the, the green back to be the feature as opposed to sort of being blocked out by trees. is another great hole. The tee shot is blind over the same ridge that features on 6 and 7, but there are no bunkers or other devious surprises waiting for you in the fairway. The hole bends left, but the right side is really ideal. I can tell you from first-hand experience that the left trees is not where you want to be unless you want to get a closer look at the flora and fauna. Top it off with a super quick sloped green, and this hole is a seriously tough par. He just dumped a second in the creek, hitting four. Not bad. Sit. That's a dub. Once you get through 13, it's almost as if the golf course says, okay, I've taught you everything you need to know, now let's see what you've learned. Five solid holes stand between you and the finish, each testing you with features and themes that you saw in the first 13. How well can you execute?
like Augusta number five, like a mini version of it without the bunker up on the left. There was a bunker there? Yeah. What's the legacy of a place like Royal Colwood? I found myself pondering this question over the course of the day. Surely the historical significance of the golf course and the club's commitment to being stewards of the game are both part of it. But there's something more there, and I think it has to do with the community. I think Tom and Doreen say it best as they reflect on their time at Colwood. What's the one thing that golf has taught you that you use in other areas of your life? To accept people the way they are, I guess, really, uh, you know, um, because you do meet some different people playing in a golf course, and you're like when you play four hours out here with somebody, and they say, you really learn a lot about a person in four hours. I don't care whether you're good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, uh, they're fun. Not to take life too seriously. Find out, too, that you're not, you're not as good as what you think you are. <laughs> Why do some people, when their when they're handicap start to go down, they quit? How they walk away from the game? I don't know how they walk away from the game. You know, I don't. I don't know how people walk away from it. Because meeting on the tee and hitting the ball down there and coming in and going home isn't, isn't golf to me. That, I mean, it's the people around, everybody around here, that's, that's what I like. That's what I come for. After soaking in our last bits of Victoria's scenery, we hit the road, north and west, in search of seclusion, surf, and sand. <laughs> right by the <laughs> do not enter one-way traffic sign. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. The crows again, they're following us from Victoria Golf Club. Yeah. Oh, God. And I'm not gonna pet them off. You feel connected. I'm not doing this. It's just me, but I'm not <laughs> Hotel. Okay. Uh, we played Royal Callwood today. Now it's time for the 15 club draft. 